This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Hey, welcome to 12 Tone. Over the weekend, I was browsing through some recent editions of MTO, the free online journal published by the Society for Music Theory. I know, super relatable story. We've all been there. That's what you were thinking, right? Right? Anyway, I stumbled across a really interesting article by theorist Ben Dwinker that explored a strange new chord progression that's been popping up more and more over the last decade or so and doesn't really seem to fit with how we tend to think about harmony. So what is this mysterious chord progression that music theory can't explain? Check it out. Wait, what? Alright, full disclosure, the mystery here is about more than just the chords themselves, but in order to fully appreciate it, we do need to understand these chords a bit better. When I look at them, the first thing they remind me of is a progression called the Mario Cadence, where we ascend through three major triads a whole step apart, creating a sense of arrival on the last one. It's a striking sound, largely because none of the scales we're used to have three major triads in a row like this. And that's not a coincidence. Two major triads in a row is perfectly fine, but if you add a third one, it creates a problem. This chord and this chord are what's called chromatic medians, which means they're a third apart, but they don't share as many notes as they're supposed to. Like G major has G, B, and D, so if you wanted to follow it up with some sort of B chord, the logical choice is B minor, which also has B and and D. B major, on the other hand, uses a D sharp, which clashes with the D natural in the previous chord. In the case of the Mario Cadence, we get an A chord in between to smooth out the transition, but that spicy chromatic median sound is still there, and it helps make the progression feel more exciting. The actual resolution, though, is driven by a different effect. We spend a lot of time in the major scale, and in that context, hearing two major triads a whole step apart sets up a very strong expectation, because the only place that happens is between the four and the five. These are two of the three primary triads in the key, setting up two of its three primary functions. The four chord is subdominant, which means it creates instability and motion, and the five chord is dominant, which means it points us toward the root, so when we hear them back to back like this, we're primed to expect the last function, called tonic function, which provides a sense of rest. That is, we're expecting to hear the one chord. We don't get that here, but we're really expecting a resolution, and the chromatic median effect makes this feel exciting, which our ears decide is close enough. We can also look at this in the context of the minor scale, where the two consecutive major chords are the flat six and the flat seven. These have less of a strong functional pull, but the flat 7 can resolve to 1 in a pretty satisfying way, so we can view this as a way of using the chromatic median effect to spice up a slightly weak minor cadence, and that unspiced cadence is the chord progression we're actually supposed to be looking at. Basically, when you hear this... The most natural assumption is that it's flat 6, flat 7, 1 in the key of B minor. It's a soft, unintrusive resolution. Could I have just said that at the beginning? Sure, but I've been meaning to talk about the structure of the Mario Cadence for a long time, and this seemed like the best excuse I was going to get. Sorry for teaching you a thing you didn't technically need to know. It won't happen again. But the thing is, analyzing a chord progression by itself can be misleading. Harmony is just one component of a song, and especially in pop music, it's rarely the most important. When you're trying to understand a piece of music, it often helps to take a step back and look at the whole thing together, so let's see what happens to this chord progression when we add in the end of the verse melody from the Chainsmokers something just like this. Did you catch it? Did you hear the problem? Here, listen to just the melody and try to figure out which note is the root. Got it? Was it this one? This note right here? The one we're very clearly walking down to in a way that unambiguously establishes it as our melodic destination? Because that's not B. That's D. So how do we handle this? Well, there's two options. The first is to let the harmony win. In that case, the melody isn't actually resolving to the root, it's resolving to the minor third of the key. That's not unheard of. The third is a strong note, it's pretty stable, and it's a bit more colorful than the root, so if you don't want your resolution to sound too final, it's a pretty good place to land. But if that's what's happening, then they really lean into it. Pretty much every phrase in the song ultimately resolves back to D, and structurally it tends to use notes as if it's in D major. Like, if we swap the last note for a B, it doesn't feel right. To Myers, at least, it's pulling back to D, so just calling this B minor feels, at best, incomplete. This brings us to the other option, let the melody win. In that case, we have a different problem. We never actually play the one chord. We're just going from four to five to six minor over and over again. This shape led Dwinker to nickname this progression the plateau loop because it sits above the implied root without really moving. It's worth mentioning that the Chainsmokers song does have a D chord in the bridge, but even then, it's in a rhythmically weak position and doesn't really provide the sense of rest that we expect 
from tonic function, so even though calling this D major feels closer to the right answer, it's still incomplete. Fortunately, Dwinker has a third option. We let them both win. Basically, he argues that in this case, and I quote, the melodic and harmonic layers each operate according to their own tonal logic. In effect, the two parts are in two different keys. And that's not in and of itself a shocking idea. In the world of classical and jazz theory, we'd call that polytonality, and composers have been doing it for centuries. Mozart even used it in a piece called The Musical Joke, which ends with the strings playing in four different keys simultaneously for comedic effect. The technique was also used more seriously by 20th century composers like Igor Stravinsky and jazz musicians like Dave Brubeck. But the thing about polytonality is that it's usually not subtle. The point is to create tension, to take sounds that don't belong with each other and smash them together anyway. It's a technique for building dissonance out of recognizable components, and don't get me wrong, you can do some fascinating things with polytonality, but it's a very, uh, what's that euphemism? Oh right, it's a very mature sound. It doesn't really come up much in pop music. No, instead, Dwinker suggests that we view this as what he calls hybrid tonality, where the two key centers complement each other rather than competing. In order to do that, though, we need to be able to describe all the musical components within a single unified framework, or to put that less pretentiously, we need to be able to say what all the parts are doing together. Dwinker's approach to this, which seems reasonable to me, is to label them based on the melodic key, but radically redefine the concept of chord functions. Traditionally, we tend to approach chord functions in one of two ways. The first is intrinsic function, where specific chords in a key just naturally have specific jobs. This is the version I was using at the beginning when I said the four chord was subdominant and the five was dominant. This model assumes that whenever you hear a chord in any context, it will have a certain way it wants to behave that's determined by its place in the scale. The second approach is positional function. This is most common in classical music, which tends to have much more clearly defined cadences, and a chord's function is determined by its position within that cadential structure. Only certain chords are allowed to occupy certain slots, so there's still some aspect of intrinsic function here, but ultimately we're more concerned with where they are in the cadence than where they are in the scale. Pop music doesn't really have cadences, though, or at least not the kind that classical theorists would recognize, so this doesn't come up much when you're analyzing modern music. But there's also a third, more obscure approach that some theorists have proposed as a way of adapting functional harmony for music without a clear key center. Dwinker describes this as rhetorical function, and it basically says that a chord's function depends not on where it wants to go, but on what context it gets used in. Like, sections tend to start with tonic function chords, so when we see a chord at the start of a section, we're more likely to hear it as tonic. Tonic chords also tend to last longer because they don't need to imply motion, so if we sit on a chord for a long time, it's gonna start to sound tonic too. And this isn't as far out there as it might seem, especially once we leave the major scale, it's pretty common to consider a chord's actual behavior when determining its function. Like, in minor, the flat 7 chord can be considered either subdominant or dominant depending on which chord comes next. We're just taking that idea one step further. This approach gives us the language we need in order to describe our loop. Technically, the chords are 4, 5, 6 minor, but while traditional functional harmony would say that's subdominant, dominant, tonic, that doesn't really reflect what it sounds like. Despite its intrinsic function, the B chord doesn't really feel like our destination. From a rhetorical perspective, the strongest, most stable chord is probably this G. It starts most sections, and while a lot of plateau loops just fade out, the songs that do have a strong definitive ending usually end on the 4, so while it may seem ridiculous to say the 4 chord has tonic function, in this case at least, I think it actually makes sense. And this hybrid tonality model can, of course, be applied to other chord progressions too. In fact, it provides a new answer to one of the oldest debates in pop theory. What's the key in Sweet Home Alabama? The progression looks a lot like 5-4-1 in G major, but much like the Chainsmoker song, the melody here keeps resolving to D instead. Which one is the real key? For most theorists, the answer is to just shrug and say that it can be either depending on what you hear, but this model gives us a way to formalize that a bit more. Now we can say it's got hybrid tonality with a primary key of D, but with a harmonic structure that makes G the rhetorical tonic despite being the 4. Is that better? I don't know, but it sounds fancier, so probably. Ultimately, to me at least, the most important part of hybrid tonality, the thing that separates it from traditional polytonality, is that all the musical elements can be easily described in either key. Like in the Chainsmoker song, the melody is in D major, but the harmony isn't G major, it's G Lydian. Lydian is like major, but with a raised fourth which results in a G scale that actually contains all the same notes as D major, including the C sharp we need to make that A chord. This allows us to use objects from that G scale underneath a D major melody without making it obvious that we're doing anything weird. You can feel the ambient harmonic directionlessness of the 1-2-3 walk-up while hearing the melody leading you back to the root, and it doesn't immediately strike you that those are happening in different keys. So is this model useful? Well, depends what you're trying to do with it. Dwinker lays out some promising results in hip-hop and other genres of modern popular music, 
but only time will tell if this is gonna be the next big thing. That's what's great about music theory, though. You can try out all sorts of different approaches to see which one gives you the best results, so even if it doesn't come up very often, it's always a good idea to know as many models as possible. You can think of them like tools in a toolbox. I won't be using this every time I look at a new song, but sometimes it'll be the most effective way to describe what I'm hearing, and when that happens, I'll be glad it's available. I mean, look, music theory is all made up anyway, so who's to say which models actually mean anything? Like most progressions in modern pop, plateau loops are often played on synthesizers, and if you want to learn more about those, my friend Volksgeist just released a really cool video about the history of synths over on Nebula. He goes through the entire history of the instrument from early experiments to their heyday in the 70s and 80s to their ongoing legacy today. And there's lots of other cool original series on Nebula too. It's a streaming service built by and for YouTube's top educators like Polyphonic, Lindsay Ellis, Legal Legal, and even me for some reason. We're really proud of what we've made so far, and we've got some big plans on the horizon to make it even better, so there's never been a better time to sign up. Plus, we've even worked out an amazing deal where if you sign up for Curiosity Stream with a link in the description, not only will you get a free month of access to their entire library of amazing documentaries, you'll also get a Nebula account free for as long as you remain a Curiosity Stream member. That's two sites of great educational content, and if you sign up now, they're even offering 40% off their already cheap annual plan, so you can get a year of access to both sites for just 12 bucks. Why not give it a shot? And hey, thanks for watching, thanks to our Patreon patrons for making these videos possible, and extra special thanks to this video's featured patrons, Susan Jones and Jill Sungard. If you want to help out and help us pick the next song we analyze too, there's a link to our Patreon on screen now. You can also join our mailing list to find out about new episodes, like, share, comment, subscribe, and above all, keep on rocking.